Good afternoon YouTube. I want to go over my latest project and that is this Winchester 1892 rifle. And I wanted to do this video, I was hoping to do it outside but it's pouring rain here, it's been raining for a while, because of, um, I want to show you what it's possible to do with an older rifle where you don't have to sit there and take a gun that's meant for one purpose and try to do it to another you know what I mean is you see some people taking a gun that's not designed to do what they want to do with like taking a, a like a cheap surplus rifle and trying to turn it into a thousand yard target rifle this gun here I bought pretty fairly cheap because I knew it had some issues and, and I've, I've done a lot of work to it um, <clears throat> and when I got it it's in 3220 it's this gun was made in 1894 this gun's been around a while and it functioned the action did work but it didn't feed properly and it had some issues so I had to go through and I've replaced quite a few things I replaced the magazine tube spring um, I replaced the ejector the ejector collar uh, the ejector spring which anybody's ever messed with the ejector collars on these guns they'll tell you it's, it's a lot of fun one to find them and two to get them fitted to where they work and the other thing is the cartridge guides these guns have separate cartridge guides one for the right one for the left and they can pose problems and the other thing with this gun is it didn't have the correct lifter in it um somehow somewhere some way this gun ended up with a lifter for 3840 or 4440 which is shaped differently so it didn't feed properly now this gun feeds this gun does work this gun does the you know it it feeds the way you want it to now one thing this gun has had issues with as well is accuracy the rifling is good in this gun is just very shallow it's got some pitting to it but that's not all that uncommon coming from guns from the black powder area so the problem I had was is you know always when you get a gun like this and you know you're gonna try to either hand load for it or do something you need to you need to slug the bore and I'm not going to go into how to do that. There's enough videos out there on slugging a bore for your rifle that it, it's not that big of a deal. There are plenty of videos. And when I slugged the bore on this gun, I got around 312, 313th of an inch diameter. Now the problem is, and I tested this out, it, this gun with factory 3220 ammunition, Remington and Winchester, I haven't gone through Black Hills. I've, I've got what I could find here locally, is that it would keyhole wildly. This gun... At 25 yards wouldn't hit anything within seven eight inches and at first I thought about getting rid of the gun but then I decided to really experiment a bit more and the one thing I did is I pulled the bullets from Remington and Winchester and the Remington bullets were actually sized at 308 so the, the difference was huge and Remington and Winchester was not that far behind it so neither one would hit anything well then I went with my hand loads now you'll notice in the target I'm going to show you here, you can see how they're not great. They're not, uh, you're not talking one inch groups, but notice they are on paper. Now if you notice from those target, that one target, you can see that if you look, the bolts are just starting to keyhole, just slightly starting to turn. Those are 3 12th diameter bolts. I had had them from other projects. I didn't hadn't ordered anything larger yet. Now there's another trick you can use, and this goes back to the Buffalo Hunters 1800s and the early 1900s, where they had paper patched bullets. Now what are paper patched bullets? It goes this almost the same technology as a patched round ball with a muzzleloader. That's why your your patched round ball. The, the round ball is undersized. Say you have a 45 caliber, you're using a 440 diameter round ball, then you use a cloth patch to take up the gap. It's the same concept. The only difference is you're wrapping the bullet itself in paper. Now, this is an example here of what I, what I was using. And you can see, you can very make out the, the paper here around it. Now that is rice paper. You don't want to use like office and copy paper because it's very thick and it's very abrasive. And when it's abrasive like that, you can actually wash your barrel out. You can, you can, it basically 
wears down your bore and it wears down your rifling. With rice paper, which is very thin like this, it's almost water soluble. You, when you when you do this, you cut out a template and you get it so that the, the paper wraps around the bullet, usually two full turns. And with the rice paper, the stuff is so thin and so easy to ruin that you actually have to, as soon as you wet it, as soon, and don't, you can't wet all of it at once. You have to wet a little bit. And as soon as you get to start wrap around, wet the rest of it and very slowly wrap it around and pinch it off at the tail. And then either cut it off or, um, in this case here, they're just enough to tuck underneath. And let that dry for 24 hours. And that came out to be around with these three 12th diameter bullets, 315, you know, 0.315 thousand. And that, I shot these, and before I did, I used this type of lube. This is a this is a lube you use with bullet casting. It's the liquid Alox bullet lubricant. And what I did was, is I lubed the bullet. I coated the I coated the tail where the paper was. Let it dry for 24 hours. Just need just a little bit, just to go over it. You don't need to really heavily smear it on. Just wipe it on there, so enough that the paper absorbs it. Let it dry 24 hours. Do it again. And of course, I just took regular 3220 brass. I had to expand it a little bit more to expand to bell out the case mouth a little bit, so you don't tear the paper. Other than that, loaded it normally like I do. Uh, this was a light charge of 2400 powder. So loaded it. Seated it just like you normally would, and then I shot it at 25 yards. And now look at the difference with that target. You'll see how much tighter of a group I got just doing that. Okay, now you see how much tighter of a group that is. That's even tighter yet. Now that tells me that I either can get, say, around because. Uh, rice paper tends to be very flexible. It kind of compresses better than regular office paper or some of these other more abrasive papers. It tells me I might be able to get away with a 313 or a 314 to 100 of an inch diameter bullet. In which case, you know, I can just load those and I will get the accuracy I want. Now, the other thing I could do is I could reline the barrel. That's expensive. That's anywhere between four and five hundred dollars. I everybody I've talked to so far four, five hundred, four fifty. The gun would have to be out, and everybody you're talking long term. Guys are, that do this are, are usually a specialty shop. And I know one guy said I wouldn't see the gun again for six months. I don't like having a gun away from me for six months. I really don't, especially a gun I like to use. And but because of this, you know, finding the correct bullets, the correct way. To do this, even if it, I have to do this and it's time consuming, it's still cheaper than going out. Because a thing of rice paper I got off eBay and that whole container is enough to do thousands of bullets. There's a there's hundred sheets there. I think one half of a sheet, well, one sheet will do 20 bullets, if not more. So, I mean, there's enough there to do thousands of bullets. It's like seven, eight dollars. You know, the, the lube is nothing. It's just a matter of doing it and the time. And that saves me the cost of having to reline the barrel. Is it time consuming? Is it is it tricky? Is it? Yeah, it is. It, but it's something, these older guns, you need to work with a bit more. And that's just the way these older guns are. Now, looking at the action here, and this... This gun has one of the nicest actions I've ever ever worked with. I've had 92s before. This is not the first Model 92 I've owned. And you can see, I'll shine the flashlight in here. All right. That's the that's the lifter. That's the, the, they call it a lifter. Sometimes they'll call it a carrier. This had to be replaced. Now, these are your cartridge guides, left and right. This one had to be replaced. This one is the original one, but I had to remove some because these when these guns were put together, they, these parts were hand fitted. This was not take one part from one gun and just slap it up. That's not how these guns were built. I had to file the back side. You don't want to file the front side because you see this little groove right here. 
Well, that's where the, the cartridge itself rides on before the shell, the extractor and the bolt pick it up and shove it into the chamber. Well, you, you don't want to file that down anymore. You don't want to file it down at all, really. I did smooth it out a little bit with steel wool, but I did take the back of it off, and that provided more clearance to make sure the round, because you see how the, there's a little bit of a lip on the left side here. And the round tends to move from the right and slot in from the right to go to the left because you get a cartridge stop here. All that had to be taken apart. I can tell you right now, I have taken this gun apart down to just a bare receiver so many times that I never need a manual to take this gun apart again. I did replace a few screws. Um, I found a few of the screws that I replaced. Here, the side screws, a couple of them, tang screws, you know, just because they look better. They're original screws, so they look, they go good with the gun. But this is, again, when you work on an older gun or you work with guns enough, you know, you don't have to have an online degree, which are pretty much worthless anyways. You might as well, might as well go out and just wipe your ass with it because most of those online colleges are they're a joke is what they are. So, you know, you can... You can do all that. You can get those stupid degrees. But what have you learned? This is common sense. This is this is about having enough love for a gun that you want to work with it. And you want to and you want to mess with it. You want to take the time. Okay? This is one of these guns that doesn't come along very often. But it's about time and patience, the effort and the willingness to do it. Just to go out there and buy a gun and slap some parts on it and say, I'm going to take a, a $400 surplus rifle and turn it into a $1,000, or try to turn it into a $1,000 target rifle, when you might as well just go out and spend the $1,000 on the target rifle, and then you look like a fool for doing it all. That's not this. This is about taking a gun apart with time and effort. Now, I've got a couple other guns I'm working on, and I've got a Remington Rolling Block in 43 Spanish that I'm working with. Now, that's a gun that... The ammunition isn't available other than one or two specialty shops that load it. It's around $80 a box, and it's black powder. And so my gun has an absolutely phenomenal rifling and bore to it, so I did buy one box of ammo, mostly because I wanted to shoot it and see how good the brass was. I now have the brass. I've got dies. I've got bullets on the way. So when it all comes together, I don't have to buy ammo for it anymore. I also replaced the trigger spring on it because they normally have a 12 or 13 pound spring. This is a military version. It now has a 4 or 5 pound trigger pull instead of this god-awful 12 or 13 pound. It's about taking these old rifles and making them work. Now, I know it's still an old rifle. I understand it's not a new gun. I understand this is not a semi-automatic rifle. These guns were fast. You could put rounds out in a hurry, not as fast as semi-automatic, but I understand what this gun is. I know this gun's limitations. It's also 3220. It's not a very powerful round. Um, people do shoot and kill and hunt deer with them with the correct bullets and are under 50 yards. It happens all the time. Guys do it constantly. I have an 1885 Winchester Low Wall, also in 3220. That gun made in 1889. Uh, it's one of the most accurate rifles I've ever shot and I've ever owned. The rifling on this gun is extraordinary. It's like no one ever fired this gun. That's a gun that I'm enjoying shooting. I'm enjoying playing with that. We've got a Remington Rolling Block 22 on the way. Needs a little bit of tinkering with, but I got it cheap enough. I know how to work on those guns. I fixed two or three of them over the years. I know what they're like to work with. But again, it's about taking the time and the effort and not doing things in a half ass haphazard manner because you want to just go out and say you're a gunsmith. This is about taking a gun and you knowing a gun that you could do. I mean, yeah, I could have bought a Winchester 92 that I didn't have to do all this with in really nice condition. But I would have had to pay another $1,500 more than I paid for this one. Those guns are anywhere between $2,500 and $3,000 and up now. A really nice Model 92 Winchester, an original one, is around $2,000. A really nice one. $1,500 for kind of a lower end gun, depending on the caliber. But definitely if you wanted a really nice clean gun, no, no problems with anything, take it out, shoot it, 
you're talking almost three thousand dollars, at least two to twenty five hundred. And they're getting that way because guys are starting to really get into these more, and they're putting them away, and they're and they're just because they are better than the Italian replicas. The Italian guns are nice, but they're not this nice, and they're not an original gun. So that being said, YouTube. Don't just look at these older rifles in the store or the gun shop and go, gee, you know, the rifling is shot out of it. You know, it's got a couple little dings here and there. And it needs a couple of things. I'd rather not mess with it. If you can get the price to where you want it. A lot of these guns, they'll sit for a while. And the gun shop owner gets sick of looking at them. And sometimes they will sell them a loss. Sometimes, you know, you'd be surprised what you can get them for. I know I can get them for... for I'm. I, right now, I wish I had the money. There's an 1899 Savage in 303 Savage. It's an early carbine, and the guy wants 450 for it. If I had the money to play with it, I'd buy the gun right now. Um, it's 303 Savage, so it's another hand-loading caliber, but it's a fun round. It's a good deer round, and it's a, it's an A carbine. It's an early, early, early gun. It's, this gun is within the first 10 years of the 1899s. It's a nice gun. The finish looks like this. It's gone. The wood, somebody tried checkering it themselves, so the wood is gone. I would go through, I would that to me would almost, but there's no extra holes in it. There's no dings, there's no dents. That's almost the type of gun you want to have somebody re-blue and put really nice wood on. And just, you have a really clean rifle that you don't have a huge amount of money in. That's almost that gun. So I tell people, go out and look for guns like that. And if you don't, you can just shoot it and still have fun with it. The rifling on that gun, I've looked at it. The action is extraordinarily smooth. The rifling is great. There are guns like that all over the place. More and more so in some places because these older collectors are either dying or getting out of it. With that being said, YouTube, I'm going to wrap this up now. Have a good day. And don't listen to some of these so-called experts that got some of their gunsmithing from a piece of paper from somewheres. Have a good day, YouTube.